Hi, welcome lovely listeners. I'm Celeste Iambo and thank you for joining me for Voices of Change, our next episode. So I'm really happy to say that we've got a wonderful guest with us today, Simon Jarkey, who works at Cathod, and he's going to explain to us a lot about his background, why he works at Cathod, what motivates him, and a whole lot more stuff. So we're looking forward to get started. Um, Simon's actually been working at Cathod since 2006. He's worked with amazing volunteers, he's an amazing person, and yeah, can't wait to find out more about his interaction with parishes, with schools, with volunteers, and a whole lot more. Hi, Simon. Hi, Celeste. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Oh, better for being with you. Oh, fantastic. We're so happy to have you with us today. Yeah, happy to be here. Good, good, good. Um, and you came all the way from Plymouth, isn't it? Yeah, Plymouth yeah. in the far southwest. In the far southwest. Okay, so we're going to find out a little bit more about you. And to start that off, we've got a quick fire round. Ooh. <laughs> so I've got some questions for you. So my first one, are you ready? Yep. Can you tell us about a saint that inspires you and why? Oh, definitely got to be St. Francis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely St. Francis. I like it because he was an everyday fella, everyday guy, obviously quite rich as well, but he lived his life probably not that different to his peers. He um, was involved in a lot of um, things that were going on at the time from co local conflict and fighting in battles to um, partying a lot. You know, oh, really? um, and he gave all of that up um, and committed his life to love God and love his neighbour and cared for God's creation. Um, such an inspiring character and um, really somebody who all of us can follow in our own different ways. We can at any time give up our current life and turn our life to the Lord. That's so wonderful. I like St. Francis as well. He's good. He's good. He's a good one. If you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? It's an easy one. I'm half Italian. Has to be pasta. Ah, oh, of course. Yeah. Okay. I could yeah. eat that for the rest of my life now, but my wife would stop me. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a particular pasta you like or type of dish? Are you a spaghetti person or a pasta? Oh, we, we love to make fresh pasta at home. Oh, really? And my sons and myself make uh, fresh ravioli. Mm. So for me, that would be my favourite, yeah. So that's another skill that I didn't know, that you can make ravioli. <laughs> okay, good to know, good to know. Taught by my father. Taught by your father. And what sauce do you like? Tomato sauce or like a white sauce or...? Uh, well, um, I, per personally, I, I'm in favour of basil sauce with, uh, with it. Mm. But people have um, uh, sage leaves and butter as well with it, which is also very delicious. Okay. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and has there been something that you've always wanted to learn and you just haven't had a chance to get around to it? Yeah, absolutely. I've got to hang my head in shame. Plymouth is um, one of the most uh, famous and historical maritime cities in the world. Half of the world was um, you know, settled and uh, discovered by the West. Um, and also um, uh, so many great seafarers came from the city. Transatlantic voyages, the first circumnavigation of the world, everything. But I can't sail. You can't sail. I can't sail. So um, much to my shame, much to my shame, um, I can't sail. I spent far too long playing rugby when I was young. <laughs> and when all the sailing schools were on and when all the sailing classes were on, activities week, I was just doing rugby. Wow. Um, so I would love to sail. And um, many of my friends are great sailors and they always say, I'll take you out, Simon. But of course, life's busy. But yeah. that's what I definitely like to do. Yeah. Wow. So can you see yourself one day sailing a yacht or we talking captain in a big ship <laughs> or something? <laughs> I'd settle for a dinghy. A dinghy. In fact, <laughs> I would probably settle for a canoe, really. Okay. But um, no, no, I, I, it would be lovely to go out sailing. The, the weather's beautiful in the summer in the West Country. Yeah. Uh, so many rivers, so much coastline to adventure. Um, it's a very beautiful place. And I, as much as I'd like to imagine myself as Simon Le Bon uh, on the prow of the ship, <laughs> Um, I think it's probably more likely I, the best I could do is a dinghy. <laughs> the thing is, I've actually been to Plymouth um, once and I was with you because yeah. we were um, doing some lovely stuff around Lent this year. So Plymouth is a beautiful, beautiful city and um, I can see why people are very much in love with the sea and the lifestyle and the fresh air and everything like that. So um, is there anything that you particularly love about Plymouth? Well, Plymouth's a very special place. It's the biggest city on the south coast of England. Okay. Uh, very, very historic. Um, 
loads of uh, fantastic things linked to it. Um, you know, people know like Cornish pasties, don't they, for example? People yeah. love a Cornish pasty. Mm. But the oldest existing pasty recipe actually comes from Plymouth. Yeah. Can you that? <laughs> if you didn't know that, you know. Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, Plymouth's beautiful. It's got Dartmoor right next to it. So mm. my, my back windows look over Dartmoor. Mm. Um, we can get to Dartmoor in 15 minutes. We can get to a beach in about 15, 20 minutes. Mm. Really lovely beaches, maybe in, in half an hour. Um, it's beautiful rivers, special sites of scientific interest. Mm. The people are really friendly there. They're mm -hmm. very community orientated. It's very diverse, lots of different cultures. It's a university city. Mm. Great mariners coming in and out all the time. It's a city of adventure. There's great nightlife, lots of lovely food. What's more to have, you know? And, and that is the tour guide um, of Plymouth, um, <laughs> explaining that to us. But that's fantastic. I think, yeah, it's really nice to hear about other parts of England and Wales and about, you know, the different communities and the different lifestyles and things. And I think we're going to speak a little bit more about that, particularly with the volunteer community in the Diocese of Plymouth as well. And um, so, as I said that you've started at Cafford way back in 2006, what was your background before you started? What was you doing before? Well... Uh, it was, it's a long story, but uh, um, I started um, out, when I left school, I went to art college and I specialised in lens-based media, wanted to become a filmmaker after that. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time um, getting myself into a position where I could go to a really good film school, really. Um, I did an uh, internship at the Northern School of Film and Television in Leeds. And I went on to do an apprenticeship in television in Italy, in Padova, which was an amazing experience. Oh, wow. Um, and then after that, I went to Bournemouth Film School, did a two-year HND in film and television production, worked uh, for a short time doing um, post-production and pre-production for some movies in London. When that contract finished, the dot-com bubble burst with the movie we were going to make didn't happen. Um, and um, I had some time on my hands, did some daytime TV as I'd done before. And I thought, actually, rather than doing daytime TV, which is what I could have been doing in, in Italy the whole time, really, um, and not having to do a degree with, I thought, actually, I'll go back and do a BA conversion. So I did a BA conversion um, uh, when I had the year off, whilst the, the industry was a little bit unsettled at that stage. Okay. Um, so I did that. And then after I the, went back to the same production company, we started to do more pre-production and production on some things. Um, it's, it's lovely doing film development, but the way I describe it is, it's a bit like becoming a professional gambler. And the, the, the gambling tool that you choose is roulette where there's no skill involved at all and it's all random. Mm. Um, and you know, it's a big risk. And mm. after a while, I started to work doing um, uh, um, multicultural TV programming pitches and religious TV as well. Okay. Where my heart, heart is, I've always had a strong faith, um, but none of the pitches got accepted. Um, and um, one of my dear friends from film school uh, fell in love with one of the girls we were working with and they got married in South Africa. And um, there, when I was in South Africa, I got the opportunity to visit some of my um, favourite places for my big hero, Nelson Mandela. And that wow. was a life-changing experience. That was a life-changing experience. Yeah. So where, where did you visit in South Africa? I'm, I'm thinking you went to Robin Island? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So. Whilst I was there, um, I stayed with the Redemptorist Order for a short, uh, you know, for a three-week period of time when I was there. Mm. Afterwards, I thought, whilst I'm there, I may as well make the most of being in South Africa. Mm. Um, and uh, Father Tony became a good friend of mine. Said, "Let's go to Robben Island together," which I relished the opportunity. Mm. Yeah. Nelson Mandela is a huge hero for hero of mine. The first time I ever campaigned as a wee lad in my teens, early teens, um, and the anti-apartheid movement and um, the Free Nelson Mandela um, movement. It was really inspiring as a young person to raise my voice with so many people from a Catholic, across the Catholic community and across mm. the nation. Mm. There was real energy and hope for South Africa. And of course that came to pass. So for me to go to the, the prison cell or one of the, one of the prison cells that Nelson Mandela was held in, particularly Robin Island, was an inspirational moment. I stood in his mm. cell, got the opportunity to visit around. The, the tour is... Um, curated by prisoners and prison guards who were there together at the same time. Oh, wow. So it's quite an amazing experience of reconciliation and hope for the future for South Africa. Obviously this was 2003 and South Africa is in a different circumstance than it was 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was really powerful for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. 
the next day, Father Tony and myself went to uh, Table Table Mountain. Mm. And Table Mountain, you get a cable car up. We were standing on the top of the Table Mountain talking about the day before and reflecting. And Father Tony turned to me and he said, because I told him about my campaigning and my hope for the future and how touched I was to be in Robben Island. Um, he said, well, never, never, ever underestimate the power of campaigning. Never underestimate the power of one voice amongst many transforming the world. A few, a few minutes later, we bumped into a group of Causa schoolgirls and Father Tony said to them in Causa, you know, where are you coming from? What are you doing? Um, and they said, oh, we're from the, the Nelson Mandela School. Oh, <laughs> wow. Like, wow crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty in South Africa. Um, but, um, and he said, you know, and I, I, can't, I wouldn't have been allowed here in the, future, in the past um, under the apartheid regime because mm. he was classed as Cape Coloured. Mm. Um, and the cause of schoolgirls couldn't be there too. And he said, had you and many other people and the people of South Africa themselves not raised their voices and taken action together as one voice mm. in the world to stop apartheid, I couldn't be here today, Simon. Mm. They couldn't be here today. So it was wonderful. And I stood there and I prayed about it and reflected on it. And I felt called, quite literally had a mountaintop moment <laughs> to change my career and to do something for social justice. Wow, what an inspirational story. <laughs> and there's something about the mountain because, you know, Jesus loved mountains, as we know. And I think great things come from being up high somewhere, praying somewhere or revelations happen. And for that to happen to you on that trip, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So that ignited, that whole set of experiences ignited your kind of campaigning spirit and wanting to kind of do more, help people, raise the voices around. I heard that you also chartered a train for a campaign rally. So was this before Cathod or when you were at Cathod? When I was at Cathod, when I was at Cathod. Um, what was that for and how? Why? Um, well, um, campaigning's really been close to my heart. And I think um, if we all come together and take action, campaign actions together, sometimes at a local level in a parish, it's nice to feel the energy of doing things together with mm. people. Fundraising is exactly the same thing. If you're doing a fundraising experience, you're coming together, everyone in the community are taking part. That's really powerful. Mm. And if it's great at a parish level or a small community level, it becomes even more powerful if you're at a local rally or a national rally. And that helps to build people's sense of um, common journey, that sense of uh, transformation that the world can happen with your action. So campaigns always been at the heart of um, not only um, the, our campaign work, but also I see it as an important part of our spirituality. Mm. I see it as an important part of our prayer life. I see it as an important part of our fundraising. Um, so um, we organi we'd organised a couple of um, rallies as part of, whenever there was a national rally in London, I'd try and do a local rally locally. Mm. Um, and then in 2008, when we were go going towards the, the COP10 in Copenhagen, it was a big wave initiatives taking place in London. So I thought, well, I'll organise a local rally in Plymouth. And also I'll see if I can charter a train to bring people from the West Country up. So wow. we did the local rally two weeks before the national rally. And um, working with the campaigns team here in London and um, my opposite numbers in Oxfam, um, Christian Aid, Tier Fund and Friends of the Earth, I chartered a train. And um, it was a pretty nerve-wracking experience. You well, know? yeah, I was going to say, have you ever done that before? No. First no. time? First time for wow. everything. Um, yeah. I haven't done it again, <laughs> um, but I would do it again if I had the opportunity. But, you know, seven, taking 700 people mm. on a train, I mean, you can imagine the atmosphere would have been electric, and yeah. it was. Yeah. Um, placards and and Placards, placard making, loads yeah. of face painting, people meeting each other for the first time, making the connections. Mm. And a lot of the connections that took place on that train that day amongst the, the, the volunteers and the campaigners who were there um, last still now. Wow. And not only did we travel up together and travel back together, but we also marched together. Mm. And that was a really strong experience for so many people from across the West Country. And I guess there are probably people perhaps who've never been on a march before and, you know, it's their first time. And imagine to have such a lovely experience of feeling like we're united together. Absolutely. And two MPs came up with us too. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and so that, that sense of people power is really strong. Mm. I think we need a bit more of that. Mm. So if there's any opportunity to hire a train yeah. um, and to, <laughs> to make sure that we could take some action for social justice and mm. to care for God's creation, 
I'm your man. You are. We know who to call <laughs> when we need to do that. Um, so, as your role then in Cafod, how would you describe it? So, obviously, campaigning is a big part of it for you. Mm-hmm. So, your community participation coordinator. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? What, how do you it's, manage that? It's probably the best job in the world. Yeah. For me, at least, yeah. um, and some other people may take take exception <laughs> to that. Sorry, Christine, but it, it's no, really fantastic. It's a really fantastic job because mm-hmm. we're absolutely at the coal face or yeah. or the the wind the wind uh, turbine face, and um, we're there constantly, surrounded by inspirational people. That's so right. my job every day, I wake up, and my job is to support people who get up every day and think I'm going to make a difference in the world. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put my faith into action. I'm going to pour love into the world. I'm going to plant seeds of hope in the world. Um, so that's my day, every day. And there's not enough of me. And to a certain extent, you're punished by your success. Um, but at the same time, it's wonderful. And as well as on that side of things, working with inspirational clergy, inspirational religious, inspirational volunteers, inspirational supporters, I've got inspirational colleagues at the other side of things too, just like you. So every day, I get the opportunity to be able to get a team's call call my friend Celeste and get a piece of wisdom, inspiration. We work together really well in the organization across the different parts of the organization. And that's an amazing organization. So 18 years I've been here and you know, it's wonderful. I've got the best job I could possibly imagine. So I'm delighted. So fantastic and wonderful to hear. And we do have great conversations and I feel you can bounce off each other and get so much inspiration and just think like, oh, we could try and do this. Or when I hear stories that are coming from Plymouth or something, I'm like, you guys are doing such great work down there. It's amazing. So if there was somebody who was maybe listening to this podcast, maybe a young person, and they're thinking, hmm, this sounds like an interesting kind of career move for me. How would I get involved or should I get involved? What would you say to convince them that, yes, if they feel something they want to give back, that they feel they can work in their community, why should they do it? Well, um, I volunteered before I became a member of staff. Oh, so I volunteered with CAFOL? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. So I was a volunteer with CAFOL for two years before mm. I became a member of staff. Mm. Um, I'd been involved in the Parish Justice and Peace Group um, around the time I was in the film industry at the time. Um, and um, I changed and started doing some fundraising um, when I begin, began to transition from film and television to, to the charity sector. And I was working doing regular giving appeals. And at church, I was in, in the church and I thought, well, I could help Cafford do this. So I wrote to Cafford and said, can I help? Um, this, this is what I'd like to do. And that's how I got involved. Around that time, I um, moved from London, doing the fundraising back to the West Country. And then I got the opportunity to work with my inspirational colleague who's now retired, who worked at Cafford for years, Tony Vasalo. And Tony was a great mentor and guide for us um, across the whole team in CAFOD. And a lot of the good stuff we do is because of Tony. Um, and it was wonderful to work with him as a volunteer and be, you know, in, in awe of him with his inspirational leadership and his thoughtful planning. And he, he's very measured and inspirational at the same time, very rare gifts. And uh, yeah, so I would say to anyone who wants to volunteer, I feel like I need to speak to the camera. <laughs> yeah. Please. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, but I mean, in, in reality, the world needs every one of us to say to, us, say to ourselves, I'll give myself the permission to give myself to the world. Mm-hmm. The world needs us all to mm. give what little bit we can, mm. you know. And th- thinking about, um, on a religious perspective, St. Paul talked about uh, the unity and diversity of the body of Christ. So if we do believe, as Christians, we're part of the body of Christ, Every single one of us is an essential part of the body of Christ. Mm. Every single one. Rich, poor, young, old men, women, you know, the whole thing, Mm. the whole thing. Everyone's essential. So if you're called to get involved to volunteer, you can transform the world and you can play your part alongside other people. And as Father Tony said, of course, never underestimate the power of one person taking action. Mm. So it's well worth it getting involved. If you're in the Diocese of Plymouth, get in touch with me um, (laughs) or anywhere else across the country. Please do um, get involved. Follow your heart. Mm. That's the most thing. And volunteering for me for those two years, whilst I was busy working, I was young, I had loads of social life going on at the Mm. same time. But that made my life better. Mm. It Mm. wasn't an additional pressure. It liberated me. So you didn't feel like it 
added on like, oh, I have to do this. It was like, as you said, it liberated you. You were happy to do it and you could do that alongside, you know, your working and your social life. So totally. So no barriers. You just went for it. You just did it. Yeah. 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 And CAFOD is an organisation that will give you the opportunity to do that. Mm. And, you know, you, you know what it's like, Celeste, yeah, don't yeah. you? I did it yeah, myself. Yeah. <laughs> getting, getting to work with some yeah. wonderful people who are volunteers, who are giving up that time. Mm. And, in fact, we've got a lot to learn from, from the volunteers, haven't we? Absolutely. So yeah. don't underestimate the fact that you're going to bring something to the table massively. You know? And you can, so in your role, you know, I would say that you can work with people locally and then they feel like we're making a difference locally within our parish. But then on a wider scale, if it's a campaign, then it's, it stretches out further, isn't it? So do you find that um, people in down in Plymouth, they're very much open to working on big campaigns or do you feel that it's a bit different or they're more sort of looking at within their parish community, what can we do within our parish community to grow that? Well, I mean, there is, it's all horses for courses really, isn't it? You know, And um, some people are called to work across deaneries, across the diocese nationally as volunteers other people really happy in the parish life Mm. some people are really into fundraising other people really love social media there are people who are really good at coordinating and inspiring and working alongside other people Mm. dovetailing people's work together Mm. so many different opportunities to transform the world and of course that'll be the same across every diocese and across the world some of our inspirational partners around the world will have structures similar to ours where there'll be volunteers coordinating other volunteers networking with one another making sure people are involved journeying with one another Mm. it's the same with us Um, and of course we've got Cornwall Devon and Dorset so it's a really long diocese it's uh, you know over half the south coast of England Mm. Um, so it's important for us to have those coordinator volunteers to connect people together right and whilst say Cornwall is a big county and that's a whole deanery we've got two inspirational volunteers working there and, and whilst we've got a really big county in dorset we've got three inspirational volunteers who coordinate there too and, and in between we've got you know three ca- the county of devon's got three coordinators working in there too across the three different de- deaneries those people are linchpins mm. um, and it's an amazing thing and of course in parishes we've got people who coordinate volunteers either formally or informally volunteers and they're, they're basically people saying Come along. Come along, yeah. Let mm. Join us on the journey for justice. Help, help us plant these seeds of hope. It's great. So, so it's like you're not really, because you could say coordinator and people think, oh no, I have to do so much paperwork. Yeah. It's not like that. It's just about being out there with your community, with your people, just working together. It's a nice kind of friendly, lovely thing to do and it makes sure things are really happening and moving, isn't it really? Absolutely. Mm. And back when I was working in film and television and TV, our broadcast network were satellites and dishes and mm. things, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, CAFOD's got a, co- uh, a broadcast network too, and that's our volunteers. Yes, yes, they and are. And our coordinators mm. are like our sort of regional dishes that then send things out to our, our more local volunteers who then broadcast in their communities. Mm. And that's a message of hope, mm. a message of love. It's, and I'm sorry I go on about it a lot, but it excites me. The yeah. fact that there's this opportunity to, for us to spread that out. And yeah. Pope um, Benedict and Pope um, Saint J- Pope John Paul II talked about being countercultural. Yeah. And being somebody who takes action of hope and love in the world is so countercultural compared to today. Mm. You can go out in, into the street just now and you'll come across people who need hope in their lives, mm. who are a bit despondent about what's happening in the news and need that chance to to flourish and to help the world flourish too. They just need you to invite them to do it. I love that. They just need you to invite them to do it. And that's something we can all do, basically. And I think the countercultural um, aspect is true. We are called to be countercultural. We don't need to be following the trend. We need to be like bucking the trend and actually doing what, what we actually need to do. Which leads me to my next question <laughs> for you. So the work that you do, obviously, is incredible in Diocese of Plymouth, um, in CAFOD. Uh, could you explain the, the importance, I know we've kind of touched on it, of community participation and volunteering in CAFOD's mission um, and how it shapes the outcomes of your work? Yeah, well, um, CAFOD, my, from when I was a child, um, I came across inspirational volunteers. We had, in my parish uh, uh, in Plymouth, we had an inspirational couple, uh, okay. Kathy and Mike Finnegan, 
in um, Holy Family Parish Church, which is now part of Holy Trinity, where I worship now. Okay. It's a funny wow. old thing. Oh, full um, circle. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And Kathy and Mike were inspirational volunteers. Mm. And they were recruited at first by when, when they were just setting up Cafford. Cafford had very little structure. Um, and they were out on a limb for a while. And then they introduced, Cafford introduced regional people who could support Kathy and Mike. And Kathy and Mike flourished with that additional support. Mm. Um, and so that was, that was a remarkable thing. So that volunteer network has grown over time. So community participation through our volunteers like Kathy and Mike makes a huge difference. So without our volunteers, without people to support those volunteers who are those volunteer coordinators themselves and the CPCs like me and other people in Cafford who support the Catholic community, people can feel isolated. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that structure to support community participation makes a huge difference. And it's like a ripple effect of hope, mm. a ripple effect of action, a ripple effect of love. And it's also, I think, it's infectious as well mm. because there are people out there who want to see hope in the world and they want to be part of it. It's a bit like if you see a group of people laughing together and having a good time and being really positive, you want to be with their gang, yeah, don't you? Yeah. And it's exactly <laughs> the same thing with community participation. If we do our work well, mm. we, despite all the challenging situations in the world, and my goodness, there's so many out there, we provide people the opportunity, the antidote to despair, the antidote mm. to isolation, the antidote to feeling that the world is beyond their grasp mm. to tra transform and to change that by working together in CAFOD through our community participation structure and alongside our inspirational Caritas network and CAFOD's other local experts and partners, we're part of a network of people participating together, journeying with one another mm. to transform the world. Mm. And if we all play our part, that's again building up that great body of hope. Mm. You know? I think that really kind of explains it and you can see the piece of the puzzle, how they all kind of come together, for sure. What's it like to work with the volunteers? You speak so, you know, wonderfully about everyone working together. What's it like to work with them? Um, well, it's a complete privilege to work with our volunteers. Um, it's such an inspiration thing. For me, whenever I get the opportunity to be with them, I'm with them, you know. Uh, you know, administration, you know, it's, it's a tough thing. It's part of, I mean, the Pope Benedict, and I think, uh, Cardinal Hume talked about building up the civilization of love. And the civilization of love is definitely administration, isn't it? You know, it's, it's organizing stuff like that. That's the way you make a difference in the world. But the thing I get the most joy from and the, the, the biggest privilege in my life is being next to people. So this morning, um, when I was traveling up on the train, I spoke to an inspirational volunteer called Anne. Um, Anne's what we call locally a deanery coordinator, parish volunteer coordinator, and she coordinates volunteers with her husband, John, and a job sharing with my um, fantastic volunteer, Steve. And the three of them are like a team of dynamite of love. Yeah, Amazing. they're so good. Yeah, my role is working with people like that, who basically are conduits of people taking actions of hope together. Mm. You know, absolutely wonderful. And they're able to say such and such is having an event in their in their parish church. Do you want to get involved? We, you know, the, the big uh, Lent walk this year, they coordinated all the parishes across the deanery to work together so the neighboring parishes walk together on on like the Castleman tra Railway and things like that, or Trailway, I think they call it now. So it's it's a great opportunity for me to work with them, but also to, to learn and to grow from them. Over the course of my 18 years, I feel like I've been mentored by a lot of my volunteers too, mm. young and old, because mm. they've got so much to offer to me. Mm. And over the course of my life, people like Anne, Steve, John, um, they've, they've absolutely inspired me. I also really agree with you. I love being with our volunteers, you know, the ones we have in Suffolk, for example. They really can inspire you and just make you want to go on and just do more and like introduce them to more people and tell them about more things that are happening um, and get them really involved. So, but also there's a spirituality element. So a lot of volunteers, I don't know if you find the same, the spirituality really makes them want to do more, want to get involved. Um, could you tell us a bit about your ideas about spirituality um, and how the gospel and the Eucharist sends us out into the world? Well, um, the, the gospel is just such a powerful thing. I, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an everyday guy. You know, I'm not like some sort of crazy, um, um, as my wife says, because my wife um, 
you know, not normally we would describe herself as a Catholic Christian. She's not been baptized, for example. She might say, oh, you know, God rocker or something like that. <laughs> <God rocker. laughs> I'm not a God rocker, <laughs> but I love God, you know, and, and I suppose that makes me kind of a God rocker. I don't know, but I'm an everyday person. But what inspires me is the love that I feel from God. Mm. I am very fortunate. My mum and my dad brought me up to have a profound faith um, and relationship with Jesus. You know, that that was a real thing for me. It meant something to me. And I hope I can pass that on to my boys. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, all the people I work with, hopefully, and my family and my friends. Um, but um, the gospel is alive with love. And love is the raw force of the universe isn't it? It's uh, the thing, you know, we live and move and have our being in. For me, that's the epitome of all things, you know, and there are so many passages in the gospel and in the Bible more widely, which can inspire us to do those things. And particularly in the work of CAFOD, you've got a long, I love working with young people, for example, for a long time, I did confirmation programs. And young people, people often worry about young people, whether or not they're going to stay in the church or not. But the work of CAFOD is a really good tool to support them. Because young people read the gospel and they're like, Jesus wants us to put love into action. He wants us to transform the world and tr tackle structures of sin. You know, he wants to t tackle structures that keep people oppressed to stop apartheid and other things like that taking mm. place. Okay. And if they don't see it happening in their churches, it's not going to happen. So those, that love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and your neighbour as yourself must be at the core of our identity if we're people mm. of faith. So that's really, really important. And for me, um, the, our faith and our joy must burst, burst forth. Mm. So I'm a, I'm a big um, lover of the Magnificat. Yeah. So the first Christian prayer, um, it's uh, Our Lady's Prayer. Um, if people were to say, what's Our Lady's Prayer, they'd probably say the Hail Mary. But in actual fact, Our Lady's Prayer is the Magnificat, the, her exact words. Um, and in her joy to being the mother of God. Also, the Holy Spirit rises up with her in it. And in that time, outpours the hope for justice in the world. Yeah, it outpours the love for the poorest of our sisters and brothers. Outpours the hope for all the world and that, that there'll be an even balanced world. And that's what our faith calls us to be, mm. you know? Mm. We, it calls us to live out that thing. And of course, you know, the apple doesn't fall, fall far from the tree because Jesus is is Mary's son and also the, the Lord of love's son. You know, he's he's God and man at the same time. And when he announces his mission in Isaiah, a reading from Isaiah in Luke, he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he sent me to proclaim good news to the poor. Mm. So we're all sent out. This is what it's about, yeah. you know. Um, so this is how I've ended up in this job, I think. This is how I ended up campaigning when I was a young person. Right. And we're, I think all of us in our own way are called to transform the world yeah. and to put that into action. And that might be CAFOD for some people, might be other things for other people. I certainly hope it's CAFOD for people. Um, um, but it, what's important is that the, the gospel is about action. Yeah. And of course, going to Mass as a Catholic Christian can just be a spiritual thing. But the spirituality of loving our neighbours and practical action is so core, cool, you know? In Matthew 25, um, it, it's the last judgment passage of the sheep and the goats, it's called sometimes too. Um, Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Yeah. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was a prisoner and you came to visit me. Yeah. When, Lord, did we do this to you, said the faithful, when you did it to the least of my sisters and brothers. So that's what we're meant to be doing. So our visits to the church should prepare us to go out into the community to live the gospel. Yeah. Um, and that's, for me, it's really exciting and it's inspirational. And I think if more of us share that with particularly younger people, um, the world will be transformed and the churches will be full again because church should be about preparing us to go out to love God, preparing us to love our neighbour, preparing us to care for his creation. And of course, there's a lovely passage in, um, uh, the, uh, in the Catechism, which is one of my favourite uh, quotes, where it says, the Eucharist commits us to the poor to receive in truth the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, we must recognise him in the poorest. Mm. So to, to, to take Holy Communion, it's like a contract. To fully receive God, we've got to recognise him in the poorest. And mm. if we recognise him in the poorest, we're compelled to act mm. and to reach out to them. Yeah. 
And so there's so much richness of faith. I'm sorry I'm going on a bit. No, I think you're, you're preaching. You just go on, you go on, because it's all connecting. And it's all, these are the things that perhaps sometimes people forget or people don't see the connections. And it's like, yes, we're going in there and we've been told to go out and we're all on a mission. We all have this mission to do. And we can use our different talents. We all have different talents, different Amen. skills. And we just go out there, use those skills, make the world a better place. Yeah, all you have to be is you. Yeah, that's it. That's it. We have to be is you. My eyes caught by your necklace that you're wearing today, actually. It's a lovely kind of beaded, beautiful necklace. Is it of any significance? Or? Yeah. Um, so I don't wear this every day. Okay. Yeah? I wear this on special occasions, like the podcast. Oh, thank you, Simon. Um, but when I'm, when I'm doing something important for Catford, I wear it. Um, so this is made of toucan. It's, it, people may have seen some CAFOD staff members and other people wearing the Solidarity Rings, made of two again. And they're the same material. They're all from Brazil, the, this particular set. Um, and this was given to me uh, by one of CAFOD's partners, the chief in charge of our, our partner, um, the um, indigenous um, um, community in um, Horaima. It's a CIRR partner, the Council of Indigenous of Harima. Um, and he gave it to me when I was visiting, spending time within there with CAFOD's program staff as well and some, some other people doing my job as well. And CAFOD is about solidarity. Mm. We're, um, we're like a bridge, yeah? Um, Abe Justin Nkunzi from Congo said this when he came to visit the Congolese community in, in Plymouth one time, and, and he was speaking at the University of Exeter when, when he'd come down to visit the Congolese as well. And he said, as he said at both of those events, he said, um, he said, CAFOD and um, he, it, the Bukavu Diocese, Justice and Peace, um, are, are two sides of the bridge. And he said, across that bridge, people can travel across one another, reach out with one another, and act in solidarity and hold hands metaphorically mm -hmm. and metaphysically um, with one another. So solidarity is such an important thing. And so whenever I have the opportunity to, it's my honor to wear this, not only in, in memory and in, in the stead of the people of the indigenous community of, of Harima, but also the whole of our partner programs. Yeah. So when we do our work, you, you're the same, whenever we are in our communities, we're like ambassadors. Yeah. Um, and I say to the volunteers as well, when you do your talk for fast day, you're standing in the shoes of the people who you're standing, who, who have no voice except for you. you know? um, um, so um, the, the people in um, Harima can't speak at church today, but you can speak and you can raise your voice for social justice for them. Mm -hmm. And when we had the opportunity to, we bring people over and they do talks and everything else like that, but we're the ambassadors. Yeah? And of course, when I get the opportunity to wear this, I wear this to remember and to remind me and to represent those people. Mm. Say, I am here on behalf of all the people across the world. And of course, if they could be here, they would be here to say that. But it's not possible for that to happen. Yeah. But we can, we can do that. So it's, it's, my, it's my way of saying this is, this is on behalf of the other people. And I wish, I wish there was another way in which we could transform that. And the internet, of course, is a good tool for that. Mm. Um, but community experience is very difficult. And as much as I'd like to have a group of people in, um, in the Diocese of Plymouth, speaking to a people in Mataruka, in, um, in Horaima, where this, this necklace came from, there are, there are language barriers and it's complicated, there's technology. Mm. Back when I was there, there was no telephone signal, there was only CB. CB, um, the radio? CB radio. Oh, wow, radio, yeah. okay. Um, yeah. So much so that when we were visiting, some bad guys who wanted to interrupt our visit were listening to our call, uh, our, our plans, and tried to disrupt our visit and oh wanted to talk to us. Oh. And there were, there were, there were, it was fairly hairy at times. Mm -hmm. But um, this, this, this is a great opportunity for me to really represent uh, the people that, that, um, that are out there. Was there like one particular thing that stood out on your visit to Horaima? Um, yeah, um, the people. People. Just amazing people. Mm -hmm. the, most of the people in, in the area there are Makushi people. And the amazing thing about Makushi um, people are they're very honest, 
very true. Um, they're very community orientated. So as you're wandering around the community, you'll see, you know, tens of children running around and playing with one another. Um, you'll look at one way and you'll see a tree with 15 lads laughing their heads off, mm. picking cashew nuts and fruit in the trees or with uh, um, slingshots trying to get the parrots. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another, another group wading through um, streams. But there's young and old uh, working together too, men and women. So um, some time ago there was a problem um, in uh, that area because there's a large area of land that uh, is now an indigenous land called Hoposa Seja de Son, one of the biggest indigenous territories in Brazil, that our partners won for themselves with a really powerful, um, inspirational leadership and with great adversity. Lots of people were assassinated, lots of people were uh, killed and attacked. Um, there were very, very challenging circumstances. Mm. Um, there was a very courageous um, indigenous lawyer who's now um, in the House of Representatives in Brazil, oh, uh, Joina, and um, uh, that they, they fought for that land and they got their land back themselves. Mm. Um, and the way they did that was together. Mm. And um, there were young and old men and women doing it together. But there was a time after they got their land, after we'd visited and spent time with them, where there were attacks on the communities there. They people had paid. Um, effectively gunslingers, thugs to go in, people were getting shot, attacked, there were homemade bombs being thrown into people's Is this houses. because they want the land back? They want them to give back they, the well, land? Well, the people who'd illegally occupied the land had um, uh, di were fighting against the, their, their uh, legal eviction right. from the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, CAFOD and um, I think SIDSI uh, brought over um, um, uh, one of the great chiefs there, a chap called Jasir, and uh, another great chief, a young young uh, chief called Pierlangela, uh, an older man and a young woman. They came here on a European tour. They met with um, the Foreign Commonwealth Office. They met with the Foreign Minister. They went to the European Parliament. They visited lots of other uh, state capitals around the European Union. And then they met Pope Benedict. Mm. And CAFOD helped organized that and stood along solidarity with our partners, but it was their voices mm. asking for change, their voices representing themselves mm. to make sure that action was taken to hold the Brazilian authorities to account to ensure that the people are protected and people were held to account. And that happened. Pope Benedict spoke out and I think that made a big, big difference. Um, it sounds like it was so powerful, that moment. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And mm. you know, the, the what I want to impress upon you is for me, what was inspiring about them, the fact that with young and old working together mm, mm. and young and old men and women working together. And that's what we strive for in this society. We've got a lot to learn from the people of Mataruka, you yeah. know? No, but it's true because there are certain communities like the one you're speaking of, mm. where literally age is not important. It's mm. like we are a community. We're together. It doesn't matter if you're young and you're old. We're in this together. We will work together. We'll find a way. Absolutely. There doesn't need to be a division. So it's true. We We really could look to that as an example of what we should be doing here. More communities, young, old, men, women, everybody just, mm -hmm. we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. Let's work together and, and learn. I, I also think that the models of community development that exist in, in our programs around the world are so inspirational. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot to learn in this country about community cohesion mm -hmm. and how we organize, inspire communities to come together, to act together, to live together. And there were wonderful experiences that I've seen and the wonderful stories I've heard um, around around the world. So if you, we were talking about Claire Dixon earlier mm. and the people um, that she worked with over the years in Latin America and the Caribbean. There are inspirational models that Claire's told us over the years about people organizing their communities, effectively making change in their communities, building a stronger community and journeying with one another. We need more of that in this country. So we need to have the humility to learn from people from overseas and to make sure that we benefit from that rich wealth of community cohesion and organisation. Totally agree. And I think you're right. We do need to be that open, to have that humility, not to think that we have the ideas, we know how to sort something out, when actually we may not. There are other people, other communities who have found ways to, to live better, to work better. So Simon, during these difficult times that everyone's living through, what gives you hope? 
Well, um, the people of faith, I suppose, good people, people of love. Um, over the years, I've worked with, as we've said a lot in this um, conversation, inspirational volunteers, inspirational staff, inspirational communities. Um, humanity gives me hope. You know, humanity gives me hope. A, it's possible for us to turn the television on and see so many stories that scandalise us or shock us. And, there, you know, we all have our moments of doing things that are wrong or that we know we shouldn't do, etc. But too often, the world focuses on those negative things. Mm -hmm. When in actual fact, just out there, just in here, there's inspirational people who are ready to transform the world with us. Mm. And um, sometimes, you know, if we're feeling a little bit down, a little bit despondent, we need a friend or a family member mm. to put our, their arm around us and say, come on, everything's OK, we can do it together. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and humanity needs that right now. And mm. so what gives me hope is humanity it, to, to actually organise itself, to get things sorted, to journey with one another in love and to plant those seeds of hope. And of course, that big reflection um, that's often attributed to um, um, Oscar Romero, but it was Bishop Ken Utener, I think it was, who said it. Um, it talked about planting seeds. We plant seeds uh, that one day we hope will grow, mm. and we tend plants that are already sown. Um, and those those seeds of hope are there, and that's the business we're in. And we're out in the fields, and we can bring in the harvest of the seeds of hope that people are planted in right now. But we can plant those seeds of hope right now so that other people, future generations, can do that. So what gives me hope is humanity. It's humanity. Amazing. And I love that. And I have the hope, too, in humanity. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. It's been amazing speaking to you today. I think we have really learned a lot, had a lot of inspiration, and I think you are an inspirational person, and I can see why they love you down in Diocese of Plymouth. <laughs> so a huge shout out to them. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you so much. And so that concludes another episode of Voices of Change. I've been speaking with Simon Jarkey, who's from the Diocese of Plymouth, works at CAFOD. He's amazing. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and I hope you feel inspired as well. Perhaps if you want to volunteer or find out a little bit more about how you can be part of the body of Christ, which we are already in, and how you can actually use your talents to do more and inspire change. Looking forward to see you again next time. Don't forget to like and share our podcast. Bye. Thank you.